We've talked in the conference brochure about a lot about the lucky country. It's not always lucky for everyone. And that's the theme that we're going to hear a lot about over the next two days. Because it's beholden on all of us to reflect on the luck that we've had, to recognise that it is luck, and not to squander it, not to take it for granted. We have to make the most of it and think about how we can use our luck, both as individuals and as a community and as a nation, to shape a better world for all of us. Some of you might be wondering why we've got on to this theme and talking about luck so much this year. Is it because we're at a racetrack? <laughs> no, it's because it's the 50th anniversary of the publication of Donald Horne's iconic book, The Lucky Country. Like we've seen with Sorry Day, anniversaries do give us a good opportunity to stop for a moment and to reflect on what has passed and importantly for us to think about what could be, to imagine a future. Our next guest is going to help us to get started on that important task. Professor John Altman is a research professor at the Australian National University Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research, where he was a foundation director from 1990 to 2010. He tells us that uh, Donald Horne made just one specific reference to Aboriginal people in relation to racism, making a reluctant prediction that they would be assimilated, absorbed and disappear. Thankfully, that hasn't happened. To fill in some of the gaps of that last 50 years between then and now, could you please make John very welcome to the stage? Uh, thank you very much for the welcome and uh, good uh, morning, um, fellow delegates. Uh, I too would like to begin by acknowledging uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Alliance and also to thank uh, Dennis uh, Moriarty and our community for the invitation to speak today before such a large audience. Who's lucky country? At the time Donald Horne wrote The Lucky Country 50 years ago, any notion of Indigenous society was missing from public perception, policy thinking and academic endeavour. It was invisible. Things started to change in the 1960s, but it was only really after 1971 that Indigenous societies were rendered visible by a more comprehensive inclusion in the five yearly census. More recently, from the mid-1970s, with land rights and their native title, cultural revival has seen forms of Indigenous communities become more visible again, especially in regional and remote Australia. In this presentation, I want to make a series of historical observations about ways of thinking about Indigenous society and economy over the past 50 years, starting with Donald Horne. My speciality is economics and anthropology, so I will focus on the mundane, everyday issue of development for livelihood. Although I am a believer and advocate of the view promoted by the economic historian Carl Polanyi that the economy is embedded in society. Indeed, I would go further and argue, as ecological economists do, that while the economy is embedded in society, both are also embedded in the environment. My argument to signpost is as follows. Donald Horne's brief coverage of the first Australians was of its time, but he did not seriously address the moral question of who owned the lucky country. The dominance of settler colonialism back then was fata complete, and like the historian Patrick Wolfe, he predicted the elimination of native societies, and in accordance with thinking of the time, believed that this disappearance would occur via integration or assimilation, symbolic as distinct from earlier physical frontier violence. He did, not foresee that, uh, he did not foresee changes that would follow two events that just preceded and just followed publication of his book. The first preceding event was the Yakala Bark Petitions of 1963 that signalled to the Australian Parliament that Aboriginal people in remote Australia were serious about asserting their customary millennia old, old rights in land. These petitions lodged just a year after Indigenous people were enfranchised to vote in the federal elections were important precursors 
to subsequent land rights introduced a decade later. The second following event was the amendment of the Australian Constitution in 1967 that allowed the inclusion of Aboriginal people in reckoning the population of Australia. From the 1971 census, there's been a means to accurately estimate the Indigenous population that has demographically flourished. However, Horne's book was prescient on two grounds. First, his brief observations showed, uh, his brief 1964 observations show the dominant colonial way of thinking about the Indigenous economy and society has changed little since then, despite the emergence of new Indigenous possibilities that I will discuss. The central goal of policy has been to integrate, perhaps a less obnoxious term than assimilate, Indigenous people into the conventional Australian economy and society. The current articulation of this goal is the closing the gap policy framework, pursuing targets unilaterally set by the state and measured by official statistics. These most recently have been called uh, by the Abbott government uh, Indigenous advancement. Policy is increasingly influenced by a neoliberal trope, emphasising individualism, entrepreneurship, material accumulation and the free market, a trope anathema to many Indigenous people whose norms and values remain focused on kin, community and country. Today's policy language sounds little different from assimilation discourse of the early 1960s. Second, Donald Hood wrote, Australia is a lucky country run by second-class people who share its luck. He was not referring specifically to the political and bureaucratic elites who devise and then implement monolithic Indigenous policy that continues to be replicated year in, year out, year out even as it fails to deliver. But he may well have been. I'm not for one moment suggesting that addressing the Indigenous development problem in Australia uh, is a straightforward task. What I do believe, though, is that the dominant approach in 1964, as well as in 2014, is a misframing that ignores Indigenous differences and diversity of aspirations and circumstances, especially in regional and remote Australia, where I mainly work. We can do better. And so I will end by turning to social justice and community-based development and ask how thinking about Indigenous development might be reframed to better reflect 21st century realities, commitments to human rights, and a growing plurality of livelihood forms post, post the land rights era. My focus will be on remote Australia, where arguably the challenges are greatest. I want to make some suggestions for how communities can be assisted to take control, how we can shift from governance for dependence to governance for community control development. But first, let me start with a grounding vignette. And I'd like to say that uh, I ran this vignette past the person who features in it most prominently last week uh, when I was in Manangrita in the Northern Territory. And he was very pleased that I was uh, making uh, this presentation in part on his behalf. In 1979 and 1980, I lived with a Ganigu man, John Moundjil, and his extended family at an outstation called Moormega in Western Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory. Balang, as he's generally referred to, was a young aspiring artist, hunter, ceremony and family man who decided in the 1980s to focus much energy on painting. And these are some of his uh, early bark paintings. By the 1990s, after the prolonged trials and tribulations normally experienced by artists, he emerged to be Australia's best-known bark painter. These are examples of some of his later paintings. Um, the mythic figure Bulawana from uh, the sacred site Dilibung and a representation of the sacred Bilibong at Gugod Babuldi. In 2003, um, he won the Clemenger Prize here in Melbourne, the first Indigenous artist to do so. In 2004, he was the lead artist at the major retrospective Crossing Country at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. In 
In 2005 and 2006, he had a major retrospective, Rark John Moundjul, at the Musée Musée Tinguely, Basel, Switzerland, and at the Sprengel Museum, Hanover, Germany. He had books published about him and his arts practice. In 2006, he was heavily involved in the uh, Musée Quai Branly Commission and was the only Australian artist to work on site. He painted the major um, bone pole that's uh, at uh, Cape Brown Lee and painted the ceiling of the bookshop. At that time, he was a significant culture, cultural ambassador to, for Australia, meeting um, the president of, um, of France um, who was launching the Musée de Cape Brown Lee and there with arts advisor Apolline Cohen. That's Jacques Chirac, for those who don't know. In 2009, he won the Melbourne Art Foundation Artist of the Year Award, the first Indigenous artist to do so. These were happy times. Balang was at his peak, living entirely and comfortably on his arts earnings. In 2010, he was made a member in the General Division of the Order of Australia to service to for service to the preservation of indigenous culture as the foremost exponent of the RAC visual art style. But after 2009, his career nosedived as his community controlled organization, Manangreed Arts and Culture, and its parent, the incorporated Bawananga Aboriginal Corporation, got into financial difficulties. And with the global financial crisis, the demand for fine art like his declined rapidly. This rapid decline for both Balang and for Bawananga has been exacerbated by changed policy circumstances that have seen a shift from a local form of self-determination and community control to imposed mainstreaming and normalisation, authoritarian neoliberalism that aims to alter people's norms and means of livelihood. In 2010, I saw Balang in hospital in Darwin for the first time ever, unwell and psychologically distressed by his rapidly declining arts career. In 2011, he told me of his deep dissatisfaction with a new arts advisor who was subsequently dismissed. By 2012, he was living in an area known as Side Camp in the township of Manangrida on Newstart, a social security benefit for the unemployed, dispirited. He had no vehicle to return to his outstation arts studio at Milmulkan. Three years earlier, in 2009, he had three four-wheel drive vehicles in excellent working order, a hunting truck, a family truck, and an arts truck. In September last year, he told me, he had given up painting. There was a large stock of his art at Managrita Arts and Culture. I watched him, aged over 60, walking to the Yayai workshop in the Managrita Industrial Precinct, looking for a real job as a tyre repairer, as required by the new remote jobs and community program if one is not to be breached and left destitute with no new start and no cash. I cannot pretend that our relationship is not sadly strained. Balang imagines that I have the power to assist in the repair of his career and to restore the fortunes of Managrita Arts and Culture and the Bawananga Aboriginal Corporation, institutions that I've worked with closely over many years. I in turn feel deeply frustrated and angry at my inability to make a difference and I lament my powerlessness to facilitate a more secure livelihood for his retirement. There's a degree of cross-cultural tension about who's responsible for whom and for what. And this last slide is of Balang last week, um, sitting at side camp with his broken truck stuck in Manangrida. This vignette captures metaphorically and graphically some of what I want to talk about today. In 1963, as Donald Horne was riding the lucky country, Balang, born in 1952, was transported from the bush in the Arnhem Land Aboriginal Reserve to Manangrida for treatment of early leprosy. Subsequently, he lived there for a decade before returning to live on his country. He was lucky enough to get land rights. From the, early, from the late 1970s for 30 years, Balang engaged successfully with global capitalism and the state, only to see everything in his world come crashing down 
after the Northern Territory intervention and the global financial crisis. While the vagaries of the market cannot be controlled by arts price takers in remote Arnhem Land, it does seem that Balang's career was on a sounder footing when communities were in control, our conference theme, prior to the latest round of paternalistic state intervention. I'll return to Balang and his prospects briefly in my conclusion. Where were we in, in 1964? In 1961, the government belatedly released a definition of the policy of assimilation that stated, all Aborigines and part Aborigines are expected to attain the same manner of living as other Australians and to live as members of a single Australian community, enjoying the same rights and privileges, accepting the same responsibilities, observing the same customs and influenced by the same beliefs hopes and loyalties as other Australians." End of quote. This definition fitted well with the then emerging modernisation paradigm in development thinking. There was no conceivable alternative to joining the mainstream economy and society. This idea of assimilation accords well with Patrick Wolfe's theorisation that settler colonial society was premised on displacing Indigenous people from their land and their elimination. While settler colonialism's negative dimension was and remains the goal to dissolve native societies, an option emerges from the logic of elimination, the possibility of integration of Indigenous people as citizens of the Australian nation, as the assimilation policy statement implies. In 1964, Donald Horne's The Lucky Country was published. Horne only devoted a few pages to Aborigines in a discussion of racism in a chapter living with Asia. Horne noted that all the governments concerned with Aborigines, and I use his language here, by the way, he ex and he excluded Tasmania because he suggested that they were all killed there, are now committed to assimilation. He also noted that while there are still some Aborigines leading tribal lives, the possibility of preserving their civilization either as museum piece, pieces or in respect to their wishes, seems small. Quoting the words of Peter Coleman of The Observer, he noted, I quote, assimilation ultimately means absorption and that means extinction. As a nation with its own way of life and even as a race, the Aborigines are still, are still destined to disappear. It is one of the ironies of our history that the only recompense we're able to give this race for what we have done is to help it disappear." End of quote. Such was progressive thinking at the time. Altered thinking in the 1960s. In 1963, just as Donald Horne was penning The Lucky Country, an important research project, Aborigines in Australian Society, headed by Charles Rowley, and funded in large measure by the ba Fi Maya Foundation and auspiced by the Social Science Research Council began. A series of books over a decade documented the diversity of Indigenous participation in the settler colonial society. In particular, Rowley's work fundamentally altered understandings about Indigenous involvement in the settler economy. He clearly distinguished Outcasts in White Australia, a book published in 1970, from the Remote Aborigines, a book published in 1971, establishing an enduring binary of the continent that persists today, remote and non-remote, and most recently, Northern Australia and the rest. This distinction, as I will show, has acquired new significance in the era of land rights and native title. A number of volumes in the Rowley series made, the Aboriginal, made Aboriginal economic participation far more visible in contexts as diverse as Urban Adelaide by Fay Gale, the Northern Territory Cattle Industry by Frank Stevens, Government Settlements in New South Wales by Jeremy Long, and Aboriginal Advancement to Integration in Western Australia by Henry Schapper. The 1960s was a time when the inclusions of Indigenous peoples uh, in the, in the from the benefits of the social democratic welfare state uh, sorry, the exclusions of Indigenous people from the benefits of the social democratic welfare state were being rapidly dismantled. But there was little sense of the significance of the Indigenous component of the Australian economy, or even 
of its population because of an absence of statistics rendering Indigenous people invisible. As recently as in 1973, sociologist Frank Jones was able to observe, and I quote, the absence of reliable demographic data on the Aboriginal population of Australia reflects their unequal status in contemporary Australian society. Under the criteria applied until recently by Australian immigration authorities to screen potential migrants, most Aborigines would have been denied the right to settle in their own country. One wonders how much things have changed 40 years on. Indigenous people rendered statistically visible. The overwhelming yes vote to the 1967 referendum, deleting section 127 of the constitution, meant that all Indigenous people were to be included for the first time in reckoning the number of people of the Commonwealth. In the, fol the following chart documents the changing size of the Indigenous population count from 116,000 in 1971 to 548,000 in 2011, the latest census, a growth of almost 500%, reflecting both a growing willingness and pride to identify, as well as rapid natural increase. These are not disappearing peoples. The availability of social indicator data from the five yearly census has also made it possible to look at socioeconomic outcomes for the Indigenous population in areas such as employment, education, housing and health, and to compare these outcomes with the general population. There is a long, subsequent and escalating history of such analyses in academia and in government, and the associated adoption of the notion of statistical convergence of outcomes for Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians as a, na as a paramount national priority, at least at the level of discourse. In policy terms, the convergence approach was first explicitly proposed by the progressive and managerialist government of Bob Hawke. His government's Aboriginal Employment Development Policy, launched in 1987, had a goal of statistical equality by the year 2000. Very obviously, um, that goal failed, in part because of overreach. More recently, there's been a rapid escalation, almost a policy obsession, with statistical measurement of key indicators for Indigenous and other Australians especially since the Productivity Commission started producing its massive Overcoming Indigenous Disadvantage reports from 2002. Most recently, from 2008, we've seen the hegemonic dominance of the Closing the Gap policy framework introduced ironically as an element of the national apology and including economic variables like a goal to halve the employment gap between Indigenous and other Australians by the year 2018. Now, in the next uh, couple of uh, busy tables, I just want to very briefly present some information about absolute changes across a few socioeconomic variables. And really, you can see this just as a bit of a glimpse. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't produce this in more detail, but I will make this available on the website. You can see different censuses uh, from 71 to 2001, and variables like unemployment, employment, private sector, uh, employment, labour force participation, median weekly income, um, and also you can see other variables like uh, participation in education, post-school qualifications, life expectancy and population aged over 55. Most of these variables in absolute terms have improved, uh, but very, very slowly. But closing the gap is not about absolute change but change in relative terms, which is what gap reduction seeks to measure. And so what I want to do in a few charts is show you, in fact, what's happening in terms of the ratio of Indigenous to non-Indigenous outcomes um, using a scale of zero to one, with one representing equality in statistical terms on the vertical axis. And you can see here, for example, when we look at some of those absolute change variables in relative terms, um, things um, have barely changed. In some cases, they've actually gone backwards in relation to relative Indigenous employment compared to non-Indigenous Australians. It's a better news story uh, in relation to educational outcomes, 
but we are still far short of that parity that's uh, represented by the one and uh, very worrying in relation to uh, life expectancy and age, people aged over 55. Uh, you can see, if anything, things might be going backwards. Although, unfortunately, from 2001, we changed the way we measure these things, so long-term uh, trends uh, are possible. So, as I said, while in some areas there is long-term improvement, in others there is intractability and even decline. Elsewhere, colleagues and I have suggested rather unpopular with a number of governments since John Howard's that it will take decades to eliminate statistical disparities where there is convergence, bearing in mind that in some areas there is long-term divergence of outcomes. It is important to note in all the statistical talk that data derived from the census or even from special surveys like the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Survey are often quite disconnected from the form that Indigenous household economy might take. Not only do such collection instruments ignore situations where there might be a significant customary or non-market sector, but they also suggest struggle to capture the reality of mixed household formations. Statistics tell you something about individuals, but individuals, especially Indigenous ones, rarely live in isolation from family, household or community. It goes almost without saying, too, that from an Indigenous standpoint, talk about deficiencies, gaps, disparities are demeaning and focus on the neg negatives. There is little focus on Indigenous assets or positives in such deficit-focused statistical picturing. But such shortcomings do not deter many interest groups and political actors from using them. Indeed, it is hard to avoid the ubiquity of the term closing the gap in policy and public discourse, in a manner reminiscent of political scientist Murray Edelman's renowned commentary about words that succeed and policies that fail. Indigenous lands rendered spatially visible. Henry Reynolds in Forgotten War has recently described the colonial land grab in Australia from 1788 as one of the greatest illegal appropriations of land in world history. This has been partially counted in the past 40 years by an extraordinary transfer of land back to traditional owners that I've termed a land titling revolution, perhaps the greatest restitution of land without warfare in recent times anywhere in the world. This restitution has occurred for social justice and legal reasons, responding in large measure to prolonged Aboriginal activism in this area. From the 1938 Day of Mourning, the 1963 Yakala Bark Petitions, the 1996 Gurindji Walk-Off from Wave Hill, and the establishment of the Tent Embassy in Canberra in 1972. All iconic moments in a long political struggle. From the 1970s, first progressive government, and then from the 1990s, a progressive judiciary in the aftermath of the Mabo High Court judgment, sought to bring Australia in lockstep with other affluent settler colonial societies globally to recognise Indigenous rights to land. The impact of these changes continentally can be seen in the following map. And you can see there, that, of course, in uh, 1788, uh, Australia was owned entirely by Indigenous nations. In 1964, when the Lucky Country was launched, there was no legally recognised Indigenous land interest. Hence my question, who's Lucky Country? Today, in marked contrast, 33% of Australia is under some form of Indigenous title, although property rights on much of this land remain very weak, despite the use of terms like exclusive possession in relation to native title that do not in fact confer any right to exclude. This next map provides a bit more detail on Indigenous land interests differentiating three forms of title. Land rights, mainly from the 1970s and 1980s, and then post Mabo determination of exclusive and non-exclusive possession under, under native title uh, law. And you can see the land rights is the orange, uh, native title exclusive is in the blue, and native title non-exclusive is in the yellow. What this map shows very clearly is that most Indigenous land is in remote Australia. What this map does not show is that property rights are highly variable by form of tenure, with the strongest free prior and informed consent the right to exclude or veto 
being vested only in Commonwealth land rights laws for the Northern Territory. Native title exclusive possession only provides land owners, holders with a right to negotiate, while non-exclusive possession, that which is shared with others, confers minimal property rights. As native title encroaches on the more densely populated and predominantly non-Indigenous southeast and southwest, the weaker, I suspect, Indigenous rights and interests will become. In the next two slides, I want to overlay some demographic information over those slides, over the land rights slide. This slide shows the distribution of the Indigenous population from the 2011 census. It is clear from this map that only a small proportion of the Indigenous population are lucky enough to live on their reclaimed ancestral lands. Although it is important to note that the distribution is of population, not land owners. Most Indigenous people have not had the luck as yet to reclaim their land. The next map shows the distribution of what the Australian Bureau of Statistics terms discrete Indigenous communities, although many of these larger communities have non-Indigenous residents. There are nearly 1,200 so-called discrete Indigenous communities in Australia, with a total population of less than 100,000. Nearly 1,000 of these communities are either on or within one kilometre of Indigenous land, and these communities are tiny. A thousand of them have populations of less than 100 people each. I'll make two observations here. First, in the next map, I provide some information on registered land claims and population, and I'll do that in the following table. While most of the land rights and native title action to date has been in very remote regions, there is possibility that determinations almost entirely of non-exclusive possession will cover more and more of Australia. Possibly, as an outside possibility, 70%, where up to 40% of the Indigenous population currently resides. And you can see that a little bit more clear, clearly in this rather busy table. Second, in places where land is held under exclusive possession and the Indigenous share of the population is greater than 80%, and you can see that in the first two rows in this table, there is potential for radical reframing of the economic development question, well beyond seeing integration and closing the gap as the answer. Paradoxically, perhaps, there is a policy expectation that with land rights and native title, Closing, gap closing will magically follow, with politicians and their spokespeople like Warren Mundine increasingly bemoaning that Indigenous people are land rich but dirt poor. Such discourse fails to acknowledge that the very reason that remote lands were available for claim was that they were unalienated crown lands with no or little commercial value. That is unless groups today strike it lucky with mining. From the lucky country to too much luck. I began this paper by raising the question, who's lucky country, to signal the, that Australia's luck was predicated on the dispossession of the original inhabitants, the unlucky. More recently, Paul Cleary has described Australia as a country with too much luck, referring to the mining boom, and as a minefield, referring to the dark side of Australia's resources rush. Again, one might ask, too much luck for whom? and a minefield for whom. Cleary highlights that despite the expansion of the Aboriginal land base, there is little evidence that Indigenous people are actually benefiting from the mining boom, upon which the nation is becoming more and more dependent. This puts his views in opposition to those of Marcia Langton, who in the 2012 Boyer Lecture describes a quiet revolution where Indigenous people were benefiting from the resources boom. I do not want to take sides in this debate today, but merely want to note that mineral mapping indicates that some Indigenous owned lands may be highly prospective, and so there may be opportunities for direct and indirect benefit to be leveraged from mining. And you can see this in the following map, which shows um, operational map, uh, mines in Australia. It also shows mineral prospects. This is not a dot painting. It's a painting. It's, a, it's not a painting at all. It's a slide that shows all the mineral prospects in some uh, very extraordinarily rich mineral provinces in Australia. Um, the question with mining uh, and, and the, 
proviso has to be that it should only occur if and only if Aboriginal people want to have their lands opened up to such an industrial extraction developmental option. And what that means in reality is having massive mines on your country uh, like this mine, the Ranger Uranium Mine, uh, encapsulated within Kakadu National Park. At the same time, because much Indigenous owned land today was historically remote and of low commercial va value, it has experienced relatively little environmental disturbance and has retained high biodiversity and associated conservation values. And I'll just show you this with one slide, which gives you an idea of some of the unmodified vegetation in Australia compared with some of the what's called removed or replaced vegetation. And you can basically see where you've had a commercial agriculture and development and high populations, you've had massive impacts on the Australian, um, the condition of vegetation. And where you've got indigenous lands, it just so happens because of their low commercial value that lands are in great um, environmental condition. This raises the possibility for new development thinking about the production of ecological commodities, fresh air, high quality fresh water, carbon abatement and sequestration, and biodiversity, which will become tradable. Increasingly, there are indigenous protected areas and aspirations expressed by those tiny remote communities located on indigenous lands to play a leading role in the conservation economy. In her recent book, Scales of Justice, Nancy Fraser uses the notion of misframing to refer to a type of injustice that arises when first order questions of justice are framed in a way that wrongly excludes some from consideration. Fraser gives the example of how national framing of distributive issues forecloses the claims of the global poor. In Australia, in my view, um, thinking about indigenous economic development has been misframed because of a preoccupation with integration and statistical equality, which forecloses the claims of indigenous people who may want something very different. I, adv I advocate for one possible reframing of indigenous economy with a concept of economic hybridity that depicts market, state, and customary sectors delivering livelihood and acknowledges the mix of capitalist and non-capitalist relations of production in many contemporary indigenous contexts. Economic hybridity proposes that especially where people have newfound rights and land based on custom, it is likely that custom looms large and can make important contributions to livelihoods, not just in the conservation economy, but also in the arts and tourism and in forms of wildlife utilisation for livelihood and for sale. It involves a broadening of the economic base beyond the narrow notion of the real economy which is absent in much of remote Australia. Let me very briefly make some concluding comments. 50 years ago, it was suggested that integration would result in disappearance, what Patrick Wolfe referred to as the elimination of the native. And there is no doubt that some powerful indigenous and non-indigenous political actors in Australia today would like to see any notion of indigenous economy and society disappear, to be thought of no differently from a late capitalist economy discursively en envisaged as neoliberal or free market. But in reality, as I've shown, the indigenous population is not disappearing, and there is a mismatch between policy goals and the ways of living and being of indigenous people and their aspirations most clearly evident at remote communities on indigenous land. So I want to ask how we might break the hegemonic and monolithic developmental approach that has become increasingly intolerant of pluralistic forms of economy and being. As the Amerindian scholar Vine Deloria Jr. and Custer died for our sins warned way back in 1969, equality must not be conflated or confused with sameness. He also noted that civil rights is a function of man's desire for self-respect, not for equality. Similarly, a reframing of thinking about indigenous development might require less emphasis on equality, closing the gap, and more on unconventional alternatives that may not eliminate disparity, 
but may accord with the aspirations of many Indigenous people. In the present, there is much rhetoric about getting communities back in control, empowering communities, but so little policy or practice that will actually facilitate this. Policy focuses instead on utopian notions of real or mainstream economy for remote Indigenous Australia. We need to radically reform our approach. So let me end with some comment on community-based development. This conference is about communities in control. I'm sure that many delegates here work with Indigenous community-based organisations. And I know that the conference convener, ourcommunity.com.au, assists many, including the company Garagat Ganji and Trust, where I'm a foundation director. I appeal to the community sector to engage with Indigenous development because at the heart of your approach are some bread and butter principles that are increasingly ignored in Indigenous policy making in Canberra. These include the following seven principles. First, Indigenous development needs to be owned and driven by communities, participatory and bottom up, not imposed and top down. There is no evidence that coercive paternalism works anywhere. Second, any effective notion of development needs to be holistic and whole of community, a negotiated process to improve well-being, not an imposed process to address largely abstract statistical disparities. Third, development needs to recognise the diversity of Indigenous circumstances from here in Melbourne to the remotest parts of the continent. The value of customer activity needs recognition, as does the inevitable intercultural mix of norms that will inform Indigenous decision making and governance. Fourth, to be effective, development assistance will need to be targeted, taking into account the reality of Indigenous demographics and patterns of residence. Remote Indigenous communities are more discreet and easier to identify. Targeting an urban and metropolitan context is far more difficult, which is why community-based approaches are so important in both contexts, not just in remote Australia. Fifth, any development strategy needs to acknowledge that poverty is a symptom of powerlessness. The politico-economic and structural sources of deep inequality need to be addressed. Sixth, the proper role of the state is to get institutional settings right for development in all its diverse forms, not to promote a preconceived notion like closing the gap of what form development might take. And finally, policy making processes must get beyond tokenistic consultation and the appointment of like-minded advisors co-opted to a state project that has and continues to fail. We need to look for more competition of ideas, a wider set of perspectives. I'm sure Donald Horn would concur with many of these principles. The issue of Indigenous development is far too important to leave to political and bureaucratic processes, especially as these processes are becoming subject to levels of political manipulation that have been unimagined in Horn's lucky country. I want to end by returning to Balang and the Ganiga community to which he belongs, living between outstations and the township of Manangrida in Western Arnhem Land, a group who are among the most vulnerable in Australian society today, especially in terms of representation, but also because of their high dependence on the state. As I mentioned earlier, I visited this group last week and discussed much of this presentation with them. Fifty years ago, as the Ngeningu moved into Manangrida and out of the bush, they were written off as a distinct group or community, destined to be sedentarised and civilised and assimilated, to disappear. That experiment failed. But like all Indigenous Australians, they have never ceded sovereignty to the colonisers. 
from the 1970s, they combined their hunting and artistic skills as a lifeline to reassert who they are, their rights and land, and their distinct, relatively autonomous form of livelihood. And for several decades, this strategy, promoted by many, including myself, worked at, worked at least in regional terms. What will now emerge after 2014 as the, emergent, as the imagined hope and future for the children and grandchildren of John Mounjil, many already fine artists. It should not, I think, just be a choice between the risk of being an artist and the mundaneness of being a tire fixer at the Yay Yay workshop. In today's uncertain late capitalist world, there have to be other less risky alternatives and mixtures, including caring for country, in this case with early dry season burning. Hunting, in this case for magpie geese. And arts production. I end with this picture of Milmul Khan, Maunjil's sacred waterhole, a key theme in his now past repertoire, visually documenting his rights and land. In contrast to my earlier Western cadastral mapping, this is his lucky country that garnered him a respectable livelihood and regional, national, and global respect as an artist. We need to consider how combining his agency with our community-based developmental expertise and advocacy might, if not restore his personal fortunes, at least ensure that others are not exposed to the high-risk precariousness and deep poverty that he has, unfortunately, experienced and endured and continues to experience and endure in today's lucky country. Thank you.